Hey, yo, you're listening to Edge Coach Quip, featuring our very own edge coaches and community, dropping knowledge nuggets to fuel your day. Hello, welcome to episode 111, 111 of Coach Quip. I'm Coach Robin. I'm Coach Chris. And today we are talking about a very timely topic and also one that we don't discuss a lot as coaches or athletes, Mm -hmm. reverse taper. Yeah. So reverse taper is how you manage your post-race recovery leading into an off-season or into future training. Uh, If you are to Google reverse taper... That's dangerous. Yeah. (laughs) If you were to search on the internet, what you would see is something like taking one full day off for every mile that you've raced. That's... Uh, that's a lot. <laughs> so for our marathon runners, can you imagine taking 26 full days off of running? I feel like you would just go crazy. Yeah, I don't think many of our athletes actually want to do that or will do that, honestly. Uh, but the good news is that you don't have to. So there's actually uh, a different thing that you can do, which is the reverse taper. Yeah, so first and foremost, what the heck is a reverse taper? So it's effectively what period of training helps you transition from post-race, so you've done the big event, post-race, and recover so that you can really get back into more intentional or goal-oriented training, or maybe you just want to kind of resume everyday activities along with base mileage. So we just need to manage this phase so that you are basically ready to begin another successful training phase, whether that's base or training for a specific race. It doesn't need to be overly complicated. The, the best way that I usually describe it is that it's simple. It's the amount of time that you spent tapering, you should spend reverse tapering. So if you're doing a half iron or a half marathon and you have a two week taper, your reverse taper should be about two weeks of that days off and then gradual on-ramp. Um, all, or if it's a marathon or iron or ultra and you're looking at a three to four week taper, then that should be what your reverse taper looks at. So in some, it really is just how you can safely ease back into intentional training. Okay, so why do we reverse taper? Well, the first thing is to reduce our risk of injury, of illness, and of overtraining. You just had your largest training deposit ever on race day. And we want to make sure that you can roll that fitness safely into whatever it is that you do next. And you had mentioned this to me earlier about thinking of race day as your biggest training deposit. And and that, to me, was kind of a mind-blowing way to look at it because we often think of our season leads up to the Holy Grail, right? That's the, the the final show. And then it's sort of like you've walked off a cliff. Like, what happens after that? But thinking about it in the big picture perspective of not just that season leading up to that one race, but how does this play into your lifelong journey of fitness or your year at, at, uh, at large is really an interesting idea. It's also a nice little mental hack to be like, oh, it's not race day, it's just my, my biggest training day. I got this. <laughs> <laughs> but we need to respect it as such. It yeah. is truly your most significant deposit and you're doing it in the purest, most rested state you'll ever be in. So we really need to treat it um, you know, like with kid gloves, we really do. With <laughs> kid gloves. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so we talk a lot about uh, taper, and it's so funny because I feel like an athlete can just rattle off. How long is taper? Two to four weeks. Especially if you watch that episode of Pouch Quip. Um, however, you know, talking about reverse taper, I do think that people, this is like unknown for a lot of athletes and coaches. Um, and it is sort of personal, but big rule of thumb is longer the race, the longer the taper. So if you have a 10K, you might only be looking at like seven to 10 days of getting back on your feet. But if you're doing an ultra, you might be looking at three, four, five weeks. So the length really depends as well on your overall health. Do you have injuries that you're trying to come off of? What was it like on race day? Was it really cold? Was it really hot? You're going to have a lot longer time to recover if you are having some of those harsher conditions. Um, do you have other races in the season, right? Do Are we going to need to use this half marathon in a build to a marathon? Um, and if so, how do we do that safely? Small plug here. This is why people have personal coaches is because this is one of the biggest questions that we get from runners who are part of group programming, which there's... I love group programming. It's wonderful. But when they are looking at how to sew in other big events into a bigger annual plan, um, that is really where personal coaching comes into play. And you can always DM me um, to learn more about that. So 
one cautionary tale <laughs> comes about my husband Brian. So, uh, how long should a reverse taper be? I will tell the tale. How about this in the bonus miles? Okay. But it starts it. like this: <laughs> your cardiopulmonary healing, so your heart and your lungs will, are always going to heal faster than your musculoskeletal system. Same as is when we introduce a training stimulus, cardiopulmonary adapts faster than musculoskeletal. That's why we have that gap. Why people get injured. Um, that also holds true in taper, and I would argue even more so because our musculoskeletal system is, if we've peaked and truly raced an A race as an A race, we are pretty shredded and pretty broken down. So we need to know that our heart and our lungs are going to be banging before our bones and our tendons and our ligaments and our joints are able to really sustain any type of load. So you said how long? One day per mile as a general guide, that's a lot. Um, but we also just think in general, a period of time off completely and then reintroducing and ramping up your training activity over one, two, three, four weeks is gonna be the best bet. And in our bonus miles, we are going to be deep diving into what the heck reverse taper can actually look like and give you a roadmap so that you can ultimately make your comeback after race day your best yet. All right, bonus miles. So we're gonna give you a lot of little nuggets. We want you to know that you're gonna be basically taking these in and kind of interpreting how they are best for you because again, reverse taper is very, very personal. Um, so take all of these and overlay it with what you've done in the past and what maybe you could have done better in the past. So let's first talk about full days off, right? So when I write programming for my athletes, I absolutely include many days of completely off I'm not saying that I don't want you to move at all. You can go mm -hmm. for a walk, right? You can move a little bit dynamically, but definitely, definitely recovery focused. When we do these big events, we have the most amount of micro tears in our muscles. We have so much protein and waste floating around our bodies. We've asked it to do something extraordinary that we haven't had it do all season, right? That's why we build up taper and get you ready to just tear it up. Um, those, yeah, <laughs> those are, yeah, literally they are, um, they're real and they really need to be respected. So during a normal, normal training cycle, your recovery window is 24 to 48 hours. That's how long your body takes to remove waste and really start to productively repair muscles. Um, when we race, it is more like 48 to 65 hours. Wow. And here's the thing, your body is super good. I remember asking Dr. Ryan this like 15 years ago. I was like, why is it bad that our body sends all of these agents to help us heal? Like, isn't it a good thing? Why do we need to clear them out with things like ice bath and compression? And he, what he said has always stuck with me. It's the fact that your body's really smart and it sends the right things, but it's really bad at regulating the volume. And because it's really bad at regulating the volume, it sends way too much, which is why we get that kind of like puffiness. It's why we get that super long, especially uh, delayed onset muscle soreness that happens after marathon that can sometimes show up two, three, four days after doing it. It's just too much volume. All right, so we are looking at 48 to 65 hours. Really, we need to respect that, even if we're doing hardcore recovery things like dynamic stretching, contrast pools, recovery boots, recovery core, any type of compression, we still want to respect that 48 to 65 hours after. Um, how many days off, complete days off, really depends on also if you have injuries, ache, pains, how you raced, like was it really hilly, <laughs> were you trained for it? Do you need a mental reset? Is it sound really good to just not run for a little bit? Your body needs the rest. Do not be scared to respect that. Um, and generally, full days off, one of my big rules of thumbs, if, if you cannot squat or go downstairs unassisted, i.e. if you don't have quads or major parts of your body that are able to support your body weight, you should not be working out. I think that's a great rule. If you can't go to the bathroom yeah, without if you can't squat <laughs> and you hold on to the walls, then right. you should not be working out. Right. And I think so many people are avoidant of the full days off for... I, I'm not sure what reason, but a lot of my athletes really question having that many days off. And I think it's because they're so well trained over the last many months that the, the idea of not being able to run as that physical outlet is a little daunting to them. Yeah. Um, but there are ways that you can do this that don't require 
you know, a month off of running, and that's what we're about to talk about now. So what does a reverse taper actually look like? Um, as Coach Robin mentioned, it does include some of those full days off because your body really, really needs it. But we're going to then, uh, in that time, focus on nutrition and your sleep. So you do have a task at that time. It, it is really an opportunity for you to have that mental reset, no matter the number of days, but then really, really prioritize the nutrition to help your body refuel, rebuild those muscle tears and repair all of that damage that's that's been done. And listen, I know I've talked a lot about potato chips on this, <laughs> on this last yeah, probably The 10. fourth episode now. <laughs> yeah, the fourth episode. Um, but, you know, our original coach said it best. You don't want to be rebuilding your body with potato chips. And that's not to say potato chips are, you know, the worst thing in the whole wide world. But you want to be focusing, like Coach Chris said, on real foods, quality nutrition as you work to rebuild. Again, coming out of what is your most significant training day. So yeah, there's a real balance that you can achieve here. Absolutely, go have your celebratory meal. Go for it, you have earned that meal. But then you also need to be thinking about how you're rebuilding yourself in a really healthy way. So this is actually the time that you probably want your best nutrition in that week after marathon so that you can help yourself get right back on track. Okay, so now we're gonna give you an example of what your reverse taper can actually look like. You know, I think we've, we've said the parts of it, the components of it, but what does it actually look like for you to implement something like this? So we're gonna go week by week for the first three weeks, which would be approximately the time, give or take, that someone doing a marathon or a longer taper for a half marathon would use. So let's start off with week one. Week one, absolutely no running. As Coach Robin just mentioned, all of those reasons, and you might be a little bit uh, sore, and, and you might not be, depending. So it is possible to finish a marathon and not feel sore. It doesn't mean that you didn't give it everything you've got. It just meant that your body recovered better. And, and might... the training was great. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I always have athletes who are like, I wasn't even sore. I know that I could have you know, hammered more. Um, you don't have to feel like death after a race but sometimes you might, <laughs> so <laughs> you have to, exactly, have to work with what you have. So if you're sore, uh, you'll, you know, after that soreness passes, we generally feel pretty good, which is the sort of danger zone when we start to feel like, oh no, I'm fine, I can totally go for a run. Uh, but no matter how good you feel, you should really resist the urge to run in that first week, minimum seven days of no running. You can walk, you can do light bike rides, um, real zone one stuff. This is like the equivalent of kind of sitting on the couch watching Netflix, but no strength training in week one either. You know, I think people are really anxious and eager to get right back to it. Really enjoy this downtime, complete rest here. Um, the exception here would be maybe core or if you had PT exercises that, that a doctor told you to do, but otherwise I would avoid any sort of heavy strength training. Again, you have to think like you have all of these tears in your muscles. The last thing you're going to want to do is go overload. pick up heavy stuff and overload and overtrain, not even from running. So avoid all of that. And then get into the recovery boots and use your recovery modalities. You know, as you mentioned, the time for flushing those toxins from our body becomes longer so we have to use our tools to help. That's a, a great way to promote recovery. And then of course, prioritize your nutrition and rest as we mentioned before. All right, onward to week two. What the heck does this look like? You said it best, you, you said a word that is perfect. I'm gonna blend it with what we, what we talked about, which is the dangerous honeymoon phase. Dangerous honeymoon <laughs> phase, week two. Um, this is where you feel really good and you, and you start to feel good, good enough to run, but really, just, just don't, right? So if you actually push yourself here, you'll find that after 45 minutes to an hour, you're just gonna, don't do it, don't try it, <laughs> but you're actually gonna kind of run out of power and, and peter out. So it's just, it's really not worth it. Um, other things that we see is that your heart rate might be all over the place. I had an athlete just get off of a big mountain stage um, race and he's two and a half weeks in and his heart rate is wild right now. I'm like, all right, so left a mark also was done at altitude. Um, uh, or you might actually find that your heart and your lungs actually feel ready to go. This is what I was talking about in the quip portion is that your cardiopulmonary system is actually adapting faster than your musculoskeletal system. 
So you might be like, yeah, yeah, I'm feeling good, which is why this phase is dangerous. Um, exercise, honestly, should be limited to about an hour. Chances are you've done a really big, significant deposit. And so you don't need to go longer than that. And that really, it should be a pretty nice light intensity. Think about light and fluffy if you're cycling, low gear, easy gear, 90 cadence, right? If you're walking, not doing crazy inclines or declines. Overdoing anything here can really set you back later from a just overuse standpoint. In terms of strength training, um, you could do that or yoga or Pilates or light cycling, but we really want it to be easier. So zone two, easy effort, don't grab the medium weight, don't grab the heavy weight, really try to keep things, again, light and fluffy is the name of the game of how to win the dangerous honeymoon phase. And last but not least, no speed work, right? We always, on that light and fluffy phase, uh, we want to keep you aerobic, wildly aerobic, so that you can get back into running, but we want you to do it gradually for a few reasons. One is that when we run faster, we hit the ground at a, at a harder rate. We're looking at three times our body weight versus two times our body weight when we are running more easily. So if you do, just at the end of week two, really want to get out there, keep it short and keep it super, super aerobic. And now my cautionary tale. Um, this was many years ago when we had done a full Ironman and um, my husband Brian and I were coached by the same coach and some of us read our emails and some of us didn't. So two weeks <laughs> after this race, we felt really good. And, and we find this a lot with our triathletes is that they feel good because it's a swim, bike, run, right? Your muscles are moving eccentrically, concentrically, so you tend to feel really, really good much sooner than even like a marathon. Mm -hmm. And our coach sent out an email and said, this is the week. He didn't call it a dangerous honeymoon phase, but it, he should have. He basically did. And he said, this is the week where you're going to feel good. Do not press. Do not press. You're going to feel like, you know, you've taken, like, you doped and you, like, are really ready to go. And you might even, like, have that, like, burning inside of you to go. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Your, your muscle skeletal system is not ready to take on that load. Well, I read his email. And um, Brian came home from the gym and said, oh, my gosh, I just had the best workout. And I was like, you did? Like, what did you do? Because I think I swam or something. And he was like, I ran on the treadmill and I set my 5K PR. And I was like, what? how did it feel? And he's like, it felt amazing. Like, I warmed up and then I just kept pressing and pressing and pressing. And then all of a sudden, I was like, I'm just going to go for it. And I did 5K and I broke whatever time it was. And I'm like, did you not read the coach's email? Because literally what he said to do or not to do, you just did. And he was like, I didn't see it. He's like, but I felt good. I'm like, okay. And then the next morning we woke up and he woke up and literally could not use his right leg because his IT band was so screwed. And it, w it ended up being like a six month injury with a lot of PT manual therapy done on it. And it was the biggest rule that he broke, but also like the biggest lesson that he'll never make that mistake again. So I always say, don't be Brian. Cardiovascular, he was ready to go during this 5K, this tread 5K, also just generally not great to do. Um, <laughs> he felt great. He came home on a high. And the next morning, his body was like, yo, dude, not ready yet. So don't be Brian. Yeah, and your body won't tell you that it's not ready during that activity. It'll be after. It'll be after. Yeah, yeah, it'll be after. And, and you know, it is. he's an... Ex a great example of someone who's just an incredible athlete, but even he couldn't recover, you know, within that two week time frame. All right. Now moving on to week three, this is where it gets good. This is where we really start to blend back into that training. So if you've been recovering well and the cross training has been going well, you are now ready to introduce some light running into your schedule. This is the transition back into more structured training or whatever your off season sort of structure might look like. But this is the opportunity for you to sort of test and see how you feel. Now with this test, I'd say, again, don't jump into speed work. Don't be Brian. You want to go with a light, easy run. I would say about 30 minutes max. And if you are a run walker, you're going to do that schedule too. 30 minutes max, see how you feel and gauge from there. So. Uh, we don't want to go from no running to cross training to running every day. So this is again, is going to be gradual implementation of runs throughout your week, building up to what your base mileage, your 
off-season base mileage would be, or if you have a race that you're rolling this fitness into, back into your training plan. Uh, I know that there are people who want to jump right back into that everyday running uh, or in running in that first week of, of the reverse taper. And personally, as a coach, I really disagree with that idea. I think that your body truly needs that time down to repair, especially if you plan on running for a long time. Yeah. Right? Big you, picture. Yeah, big picture. If you if you plan on being a lifelong runner or you have goals that extend beyond this race that you just did, it is so important to give yourself the full time so that you don't end up in a six-month injury situation. All right, to recap, reverse taper is exactly that. It's backing out your effort so that you can gradually and safely rebuild it and maximize your gains and minimize your chance of injury or overuse. All right, timing of a reverse taper, you should have seven to 14 days of no running at all, and then taking it easier over several weeks. Full days off, that's right. Doing nothing when it comes to running. Take them early, right after your biggest effort, and your body will thank you long-term. And what this looks like in practice, it, it goes from days off to cross training to that gradual implementation back into your training plan, just like a taper, but in reverse. Alas, Brilliant. <laughs> the reverse taper. Tag us in what you're doing. We want to see it. Especially those social activities, because that's really what you should be focusing on, social and recovery. Hey, social recovery. It's a thing. See you next time. Later. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Coach Quip, original music performed by Mend. Follow us online on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Edge Athlete Lounge. Our podcast lives in the blog section of our website. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast, and you can check out the show notes for additional ways to contact us. Ready, set, onward we go.